Hello everyone and welcome to your now 15th lecture in earth science. This is Dr. Hurt and today we're going to have a relatively short lecture just going to be talking about ocean water. I think I only have like uh, 17 slides or something like that compared to usually I have something like you know 30 or 40 something so uh, I think it's going to be a little bit shorter today. So anyway talking about ocean water this is chapter 16 in your book which I do encourage you to read. So uh, Let's get it right into it. We're just going to be talking about the properties of ocean water today. So the first thing that you want to know is the ocean is salty. And I'm sure you all know that, of course, living here by the ocean, as you do. But how much salt exactly is in it? And that's something you should know for the test. And the answer is that it's uh, got 35 grams on average uh, per liter of water. Now, one uh, liter is equal to 1,000 milliliters and remember that uh, the density of water is one gram per milliliter so that means that 1000 milliliters is equal to 1000 grams of water so 35 grams in 1000 grams 35 divided by a thousand is going to be equal to 3.5 percent okay so the salinity on average of the water is 3.5 percent but you'll see that it varies anywhere from like 3.4 to 3.7. Average is 3.5. We are going to explore why variations occur in the ocean water salinity. We'll get into that more later. But uh, ocean water is, of course, it's mostly water, nine, 965 grams of water, 35 grams of salt on average. Now, what does that salt consist of? So you got to know the least four most common elements of that ocean water salt. So those four most common constituents are, of course, sodium and chlorine. Sodium chloride, you know, is salt, sea, like sea salt that you might put on your food. Okay, so most of it's sea salt, sodium chloride. But there's also a lot of something called uh, magnesium sulfate, which is Epsom salt. Now, some of you might use Epsom salt, especially if you're athletes. You might soak, you know, um, your muscles in Epsom salt, sometimes good for your for aching muscles and things like that. Uh, but it's magnesium sulfate epsom salt so that's the other major constituent of ocean water there are other things that are common as well as, as uh, such as calcium potassium um, carbon dioxide which is what makes carbonic acid and this carbonic acid is very important even though it's a small constituent of the ocean water uh, it's pretty important because carbonic acid is what causes ph to go down and it makes that acid uh, water more acidic. There's also things like bromide, boric acid, strontium, fluoride. As you can see, uh, these are very minor constituents, um, but they are in uh, some abundance. So you can see this is a kind of a graph that shows the composition of sea salt. And you can see that by and large, most of it is sodium chloride and magnesium sulfate. And everything else is kind of shuffled into this little corner over here, calcium, potassium, and everything else is just in this minor constituents category, okay? So less than 1%, basically 99% of ocean water, more than 99% of ocean water, is sodium chloride, magnesium sulfate, and a little bit of potassium and, and, and uh, calcium, okay? So uh, it's kind of interesting, the whole art of collecting sea salt, like these gentlemen here are doing. Um, the way that you do it is you, you have these pools and um, it's not as it's not as easy as you might think. So you have a pool of of water, and um, you know the water is a, you, the ocean water is evaporating in this pool. Okay, so it's evaporating and going off. The water is going off into the atmosphere and leaving behind the salt. However, the first thing you have to do you can't just collect the salt because uh, there's going to be magnesium sulfate mixed into it and that's impure and uh, magnesium sulfate by the way is a pretty powerful um what do you call it uh gosh the name is escaping me right now it's it's uh gosh so it's what you take for constipation i can't remember the name of that right now it's not a diuretic it's something else um anyway but anyway you don't you don't want to be you won't you don't want to be eating a lot of that so uh, you have to remove the magnesium sulfate first so the magnesium sulfate is going to precipitate out here. And as the water level lowers after evaporation, then the sodium chloride starts to 
precipitate out, and that's what you can collect. But you have to get rid of that magnesium sulfate that will precipitate out first. So anyway, it's kind of interesting how they how they do it. Um, there was a uh, gentleman named J John Jolly who actually tried to figure out the age of the Earth by the saltiness of the ocean because he calculated, he knew the saltiness of the ocean, and he calculated, okay, there must be this many grams of salt in the ocean. And he also calculated how much rivers bring into the ocean. And he figured out that, well, rivers are bringing in however many grams of, ocean, of uh, salt into the oceans per year. Therefore, uh, the age of the earth must be, and he calculated about 100 million years old. Now, he was way off uh, because he didn't know the, about plate tectonics and about how uh, there are processes that remove salt from the ocean. Um, but it was kind of an interesting attempt at figuring out the age of the Earth before the age of radiometric dating that allowed us to uh, calculate the age of the Earth from, um, from uh, isotopes, radioactive isotopes. So where does the saltiness come from? It comes from two places. It comes from a river runoff, okay, so the dissolved load of river runoff. And it also comes from outgassing at mid-ocean ridges, at volcanic ridges and volcanoes in the ocean. So we're going to talk about each of these. Um, you know, uh, as rivers flowing over, bringing, bringing all the um, water that's collected and run off of the continents, as those come into the ocean, run into the ocean, they bring along with them not just water, but a lot of sand, silt, sediment, and also a lot of dissolved salts. So there's, even though water is, the water that comes into the ocean is mostly fresh, there is some salt uh, dissolved into it. Now, keep in mind that the ocean water is saltier. This is definitely saltier than this. This is fresher. However, this is kind of like the last stop for salt on its journey from the continents into the ocean. So when the salt reaches the ocean from the runoff from rivers, uh, it will stay while the H2O gets evaporated, right? So H2O is constantly getting evaporated um, from the surface of the of the ocean and so it causes the the um, salinity to continuously go up because H2O can be removed from oceans through evaporation but the but the salt cannot be removed by evaporation salt is removed slowly by plate tectonics and subduction we'll talk about that um, next lecture but uh, so it's not like the salinity is constantly increasing in the oceans but um, it, it is more difficult to remove than the water, which can easily evaporate. The other source of, but I just one thing I wanna make very clear, the, the runoff is fresher water than the ocean water, okay? Oceans are saltier than the freshwater runoff. So a lot of people get confused because they think, oh, well, salt gets into the ocean from the rivers, therefore the rivers must be saltier. No, that's not true. And anyone who's tasted river water knows it's fresher than uh, you know, it's not salty like the ocean water. So um, anyway, the other source of salt into the oceans is outgassing at um, underwater volcanoes. So there's these things kind of cool uh, called black smokers that um, occur at volcanic vents underwater. Now, 80% of volcanoes that happen on Earth happen at uh, happen underwater uh, in the oceans. So these volcanic vents are constantly releasing salts and gases into the oceans. What you're seeing right here is actually, um, it's actually uh, iron sulfide. So, uh, you know, volcanoes release a lot of sulfur. That sulfur reacts with iron in the water and it forms iron sulfide, which is, this, which is the smoke that you see right here. So I have some kind of cool videos for you. Um, let me bring it up right here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, it's this, this one here. Um, so hydrothermal events. I also want to show you it's kind of cool because um, hydrothermal vents also have a lot of very interesting life that's deep beneath the ocean um, uh, you know, surface level. So it's, it's pretty interesting to look at both the very unusual ecosystems that occur there as well as these very interesting um, kind of chimney-like structures that are built up through volcanic hydrothermal gassing. So hydrothermal just means hot water. So these hot water vents, uh, you know, start to build up around volcanoes from the ocean water circulating through um, through the uh, volcanic area and the residual heat left over from the volcano. So I'll play this for you. 
This is, by the way, put out by um, Monterey, the um, aquarium at Monterey, California. If you ever find yourself in that part of the country, Monterey, California, it's a very beautiful part of the country. Highly suggest you check out this aquarium. It's it's uh, world class, uh, absolutely uh, mo one of the best aquariums. We have a really good one here, of course, in Corpus Christi. I think the Monterey is just a little bit better, but um, it's it's worth checking out if you're out there. If you like sea otters. Oh gosh, it's and in it's in Spanish. That's a huge a, okay. chimney comes into view, <laughs> and it's just packed with giant two worms. Everybody was out of their seats in the control room taking pictures of the screens with our phones. We looked like a bunch of tourists. We were. <laughs> My name is Shannon Johnson, and I'm a research technician at Abari, and I'm one of the few people in the world who's been lucky enough to visit many of the most beautiful hydrothermal vents around the world. Hydrothermal vents are probably one of the most extreme places on Earth to live. It's basically an underwater volcano. We would definitely melt apart if we were down in this area, and yet they're inhabited by these amazing creatures. Vents are very special places in the ocean. They act like these little island oases of food for animals because a lot of the bottom of the ocean is just mud. There's no sun. There's no light at all. It's completely pitch black. And these animals that are living on hydrothermal vents, they're completely reliant on this system called chemosynthesis where bacteria are being fed by minerals coming out of the bottom of the ocean rather than sunlight coming down from the sky. And all the animals in hydrothermal vents are reliant on the bacteria for nutrition. Riftia pachyptala are these giant two worms and they're kind of the poster child of hydrothermal vents. They're often four feet tall, so they're very imposing figures in the deep sea. They have no mouth, no gut, and instead have this beautiful red plume that they use for gas exchange. That's their gills. They pull minerals out of the water and deliver those to bacteria inside their bodies, and the bacteria feed the worms. Zoarsid fishes are these really cool fishes that live in and amongst the Riftia tube worms. The Riftia are not bothered at all by the Zoarsids because the Zoarsids just help clean them and keep the parasites and things off of them, like the clownfish helps the anemone. Alvanella pompeata are the coolest little worms. They look like little fuzzy wuzzy stuffed animals. They have a fleece-like coating of bacteria that helps protect them from some of the hottest water that comes out of the vents. They extend their gills out into much cooler water and they do this little dance in between the cooler water and the hotter water in and out of their tubes so that they can go into the hot part and extract minerals from the vents and then go back out to the cooler water and extract oxygen out of the water. So they're like, ha ha ha, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> There's nowhere else really like it on Earth where you have these amazing creatures that live right up close to these really extreme environments. Every time we go to sea, we learn new things and find new discoveries, new species, new places, and it's so important to keep going back out there and doing exploration and discovery. Okay, so anyway, hopefully you were able to hear that and it got picked up well enough on the microphone. But uh, yeah, that's just some of the unusual ecosystems that um, occur at black smokers. But the main thing here um, for this class is to know that black smokers release a lot of um, the salts of the ocean into the ocean. So it's a major source of salt for the ocean. So let's talk a little bit about variations in uh, some of the properties of the ocean water. So the first thing we're going to talk about is... Um, First of all, just uh, you know, 
I want to point out one thing is just volume, you know, 97% of all water on earth is this ocean water. So, you know, the fresh water that we drink is only 3% of earth's water. I think I mentioned that in the groundwater lectures. So, um, the salinity on average, like I said, 3.5%, but it varies, uh, you know, it can vary all the way from 3.1% all the way, all the way to 3.9%. So you can see that the saltiest places are in the Mediterranean, the Persian Gulf there. You can see um, in the Atlantic right here, right here. You can see those are kind of the saltiest places where the least salty places are the poles and off the coast of uh, Pacific Northwest, kind of right here. Actually, you'll notice that some of the least salty places are kind of along the equator, okay? So uh, the equator and the poles are not very salty, whereas the saltiest places are maybe at about 30 degrees latitude, north and south. So this is maybe 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south. Whoops. Okay, so uh, what causes these variations in salinity? Because they're a little bit, they look like a little bit random. Like why is the equator, you know, um, why is the equator not very salty? The the uh, the water at 30 degrees north and south are very salty. It's a little bit hard to figure that out. So that's surface water salinity. Oh, by the way, I should mention something. Um, ocean water can hold actually like, it can have maybe 25% salinity at most. So um, we, so ocean water is way, way beneath saturation. So it could, it could hold a lot more salt but it doesn't. If you go to places like the Dead Sea, um, you know, in, in Israel, uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's so much salt there, it's saturated and salt is actually precipitating out of the sides of the Dead Sea. So anyway, uh, you could have a lot more salt, but it doesn't. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how, so this is, this is surface salinity. But let's talk a little bit about salinity changes with depth. So you'll notice that, um, in the tropics, so around you know 20 to 30 degrees, you know uh, 20 to 30 degrees uh, north and south latitudes, we have the highest surface salinities. The equator is kind of medium, and high latitudes like at the poles, it's the lowest salinity. But you'll notice that as we go down with depth, that the salinities become more and more and more the same. Okay, so. Um, this, this initial area near the surface of about 500 meters where there's a very high slope, a very, a very high change to the, surf, to the salinities as you go down with depth, that's called the halo cline. Halo means salt, cline means slope. So it's a, a very steep slope, a very steep change to the salinity as you go down with depth in the first upper 500 meters of the ocean. So that's what the halo cline is. When you get down to the depth, so once you're at like 2,000 meters deep, um, the salinities, whether you're at the poles or the equator or at the tropics, they're all about the same, okay? So uh, what causes these variations in ocean surface salinity? There are five different causes uh, that change it. So the runoff from rivers can lower the salinity as fresh water comes into the ocean. Evaporation is the major, evaporation precipitation, these are the major um, causes of uh, variation in surface water salinity. Evaporation will increase salinity, precipitation will decrease it, okay? So, you know, if you have a body of water and it's evaporating, what evaporates out is the H2O, the water, but the, but the salt, the NaCl, stays there, right? So the NaCl stays in the water while the H2O evaporates off. So that increases that increases um, salinity. Okay, so uh, precipitation, on the other hand, can decrease it, right? When H2O is coming back into the water by, you know, a storm cloud or something like that, and you have rain falling, and that's going to increase the H2O relative to the NaCl, and that's going to increase or decrease your salinity. Now, in the poles, we also have this added um, thing of the sea ice formation, sea ice melting. When sea ice forms, it increases salinity because as the ice forms, again, if you imagine your, your salt water with NaCl, uh, 
if we have an iceberg form, let me get a different color to draw my iceberg. If I have an iceberg form or sea ice form, so here's my iceberg, right? H2O will enter will enter the ice, but the NaCl won't, right? Salt salt does not go does not go into that ice. Okay? So it's going to extract the H2O but leave the NaCl. That's going to make the ocean saltier. Vice versa, when this this ice melts, it's going to cause the salinity to go down because it's going to dilute dilute the um, solution. Okay. So um, it, really, evaporation is one of the biggest causes of variation in salinity over the ocean surface. So this is a map of mean annual evaporation. Okay. So it's showing where evaporation is highest, and you'll notice that it looks a lot like our salinity map. Here's the salinity map. Okay. So you'll notice that this and this look rather similar, right? And the reason they look rather similar is because salinity is being mostly a result of evaporation, okay? So evaporation is highest in the tropics, highest around like 20 to 30 degrees, um, between 20 and 30 degrees uh, north and south latitudes, and it's lowest, it's, it's um, lowest in the poles, right? You'll see at high latitudes, evaporation is pretty low, okay? So that, that causes the water to be fresher. And you can see that this, fre this like um, kind of yellow aquamarine color represents fresher water, okay? Redder means more, um, more salt, okay? Now you might ask why, the, but look at, this is kind of interesting. Notice that along the equator, along the equator, the water is um, not as salty you'll notice that there is not as much evaporation um, along the equator. So why is that? Isn't that a little bit weird? Like, wouldn't you expect the equator to have the most evaporation because it's because it's, you know, the hottest and the and around the equator, it is hot, but it's also a lot of rain and it's also very cloudy. Um, the reason has for that has to do with these um, convective cycles of air within our Earth. So uh, air rises because it's so hot at the at the equator we have this thing called the intertropical convergence zone this is where air rises and what happens is that air falls it falls at um, about 20 to 30 degrees north latitude and that creates something called the hadley cell so as air rises we're going to learn about this as we talk about weather and sub in um, subsequent lectures but this is a good introduction as air rises at the equator, it cools off. Air cools as it rises. It cools off and it causes a lot of cloud coverage and a lot of precipitation. So there's not a lot, there's not as much evaporation at the equator because even though it's hot, there's a lot of cloud cover and a lot of precipitation and that tends to dilute the ocean water. Whereas what you have at about 30 degrees north, 20, 20 30 degrees north is you have descending air. Descending air warms up as it descends, it's dry, it's hot. So this is causes hot, dry air to descend and you get a lot of evaporation here. So this is a place of a lot of evaporation. This is a place of a lot of precipitation. So you get a lot more precipitation at the equator than you do at 20 to 30 degrees north where you get a lot of evaporation. So that's what explains these um, kind of strange surface water salinity trends that we see. All right, so moving on to temperature. Temperature is a lot more easy to understand. Um, you know, it's hottest at the equator, okay? Um, it's moderately hot in the tropics. It gets cooler and cooler and cooler as you get to the poles, right? So that makes a lot more sense, a lot easier to explain. Now, if you go to the tropics, you'll see that, um, or sorry, if you go to the equator, you notice that surface water is very hot, about 25 degrees Celsius. It's pretty hot water, okay? Uh, that's the average. So it's going to change with depth very fast. So that, that rapid change with depth in the temperature is called the thermocline. You'll notice that the tropics are on average a little bit cooler, 50, around 15, 16 degrees Celsius. Again, they're going to rapidly decline as you go deeper into the water. And you might be aware that as you move deeper into the water, probably just from swimming and things like that in the ocean here, in Corpus Christi, you're aware that things get get cooler as you go deeper into the water. Now in the poles, it's kind of interesting. 
um, you'll notice there is no thermocline. There is no rapid change in the uh, temperature of the water as you go down with depth. And the reason is because it's already very cold, right? Um, water can't get any colder than zero degrees Celsius. Once it gets below zero degrees Celsius, it begins to freeze, right? So, um, you know, in the poles, the water is cold on top and it's cold at the bottom as well. So um, you only get a thermocline, a strong thermocline in the tropics and in the equator in middle latitudes, okay? So notice, um, just like with salinity, the halocline and the thermocline, these are surface um, phenomenon. There's rapid changes in the salinity and rapid changes in the temperature in the upper, like maybe 1,000 meters of the ocean. But once you get below 1,000 meters, notice that it doesn't really matter where you are in uh, the ocean. So whether you're at the poles or the equator, they're all about the same once you get to about 1,000 meters depth or below things start to kind of uh, converge and we get we get the same conditions, right? So um, uh, oceans are very homogenous, especially once you get to like 3000 meters depth, it doesn't matter where you are. Oceans are very homogenous all over the world. So a lot of the variations we see in temperature and salinity, they're surface variations, okay? Let's talk a little bit about ocean water density. So there are two things that affect ocean water density. Um, now, density is very important because it's going to affect how the water convex, right? Um, denser water is going to sink, right? So dense water sinks, less dense water is going to float, right? So it's going to create these convective cells, right? And it's going to affect ocean currents and how ocean water flows and convex. So um, we want to we want to know something about density. So there are two major effects. Um, that determine ocean density. One of them is temperature. So as you, um, this is density on the vertical axis. This is temperature on the horizontal axis. You'll notice that as you go uh, to get progressively warmer water, the density goes down. So warm water likes to float. So you usually have warm water on top, cold water on the bottom, okay? And sometimes you can have warm water just floating very happily on top. And that's, by the way, why, why you have thermoclines and halo-clines, why there isn't mixing um, between the surface water and the deeper, deeper water. There's no mixing because the warm water is very happily just sitting on top, heated by the sun, and it doesn't, it doesn't want to convect and mix with the cold water below because the cold water is denser. It's very happy being there down on the bottom. Um, now, salinity also has an effect here. So salinity makes density go up. So as you move up in salinity, it causes density to go up as well. Okay. So what you have happen at the poles, for instance, um, you know, you, if you look at the polar water, it's cold all the time, right? It's always cold. So when you have sea ice formation in the winter time, it's going to make the it's going to make the water uh, surface water less saline. It's going to make it less dense. And then when you have sea ice melting in the summer, it's going to cause the water to be um, or sorry when you have sea ice formation in the winter, it causes the sea ice to form. It makes the water on top denser, more saline, and that's going to cause it to sink, and uh, creates a very powerful convective um, current. And actually. That current is very important. It creates the California current, and it also creates, I'm looking for a picture. I don't know if I have a picture of these, of the California current and the Humboldt current. I um, wish I did. I guess I don't have a picture of uh, currents, but it creates the California current and the Humboldt current that bring cold water off the coast of South America and the west coast of uh, our country. And they're very important for um, fishing. You know, Some of the best fishing grounds are there. Um, in the Humboldt and California currents. Um, so very important commercial fishing, uh, very important for commercial fishing. So anyway, uh, moving on to back to ocean water density. So in low latitudes, uh, so things like mid latitudes, tropics, equator, we have a very strong pink nocline. And the pink nocline is a rapid change in the density of the water as you go down with depth. So at the surface, the water is less dense. And then once you get down to about 500 meters, the water density is basically uh, consistent. 
But the reason that you have this pink decline in low latitudes is because you're getting a lot of heat. You know, if here's here's Mr. Sun here. Okay. There's the sun. He's heating up the surface of the water. The water is warm and it's less dense because of that. So the less dense water sits on top. But in the high latitudes, right, in, in uh, polar areas, you don't have so much sunlight. And so the water is cold at the surface. It's cold at depths. And you don't have a pink necline. Okay. So there's no pink necline in, um, in the polar regions. Okay. Higher salinity leads to higher density. Higher temperature leads to lower density. Um, in equatorial waters, there's a large decrease in temperature leading to a large change in density with depth. That's called the pink necline. Let's talk about something called heat capacity now. So heat capacity is um, how difficult, like how much, how difficult or how easy it is to change the temperature of a material, okay? So um, if it takes a lot of energy to heat up some material, that is a large heat capacity. If it doesn't take very much energy to heat up a material, that is a low heat capacity. So water is unique because it retains heat very well. It's very difficult to cool down, very difficult to heat up. And anyone, you know, if you ever try to like put, um, for example, uh, you want to make some tea, you put a mug of water in the microwave. Are you, were you like surprised like how long you have to put it in the microwave to get that heat up? You know, it really takes a long time to get it to heat up. Um, you know, sometimes you have to put it in there three, four, five minutes to get it to be at a good temperature. Um, that's because it takes a lot of energy to heat up water. It has a very high heat capacity. It has a for for the kind of material that it is, it has an unusually high heat capacity. So um, what's kind of cool about that though is it makes it very difficult to change the temperature of water. Okay. So you know that um, in coastal areas, this is an advantage because it, it dampens seasonal temperature variations near the shore. So if we look at two cities, let's take Chicago, Illinois and Seattle, Washington. Chicago, Illinois is inland. It means it's in the middle of the country, far away from the coast. Of course, it's next to the Great Lakes, but you know it's far away from the ocean water. Seattle is on the coast, right? It's coastal, just like Corpus Christi. So uh, you'll notice that even though these two cities are at the same latitude, they get the same amount of, you know, of yearly, they get the same amount of uh, sunlight. You'll notice that Chicago has a much higher max temperature and a much lower minimum temperature than Seattle, right? Seattle has much more like even temperatures. And you know that too, being here in Corpus Christi, like, you know, during the summer here, it's crazy. It's like 15 degrees cooler here than it is if you go directly, almost directly west and just go to like San Antonio. It's it's often during the summer, it's a lot cooler here, you know, um, than it is inland. And that's because when we're on the coast, that high heat capacity of the ocean water retains, it's very hard to heat up that ocean water. So it helps dampen seasonal variations in temperature. So um, another aspect of water is thermal expansivity. So it's thermally expansive. That means that when ocean water gets, gets warm, it expands in terms of volume. So this is yet another thing that can contribute to sea level rise. So people tend to think of sea level rise as just having to do with, you know, glaciers. Um, glaciers are melting and they dump that, that glacial meltwater into the oceans and it causes sea level rise. So that is one, one aspect of sea level rise. Um, however, just getting warmer water will cause sea levels to rise. So if you have a 5,000 meter column of water, which is about average for, that's how average, you know, how tall the, the water actually is, uh, a column of ocean water actually is, uh, that's, that's, that's the average uh, depth of the ocean. You can see that um, if, if the oceans increase by one degree Celsius, that column is going to expand. So it's going to thermally expand uh, according to that one degree increase in temperature. So uh, that can lead to um, about 26 centimeters per degree Celsius that uh, 
you know, so you, so if, if the oceans were to increase one degree Celsius, that would lead to about 26 centimeters in the average height of the um, ocean water. So that's pretty big. Um, you know, for places, you know, so what is 26 centimeters? It's, it's uh, about, you know, about a foot or so, about 10 inches. So it's something, you know, uh, for places that, right, have very low sea level, very low um, topography, they're very close to sea level, it's kind of a big deal. So it's just a, kind of another thing that contributes to sea level rise. Um, another problem uh, we're kind of having are, you know, I want to talk about is ocean acidity levels. Uh, you know, c carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been steadily increasing, um, you know, over the industrial age. So uh, we're up to like, you know, going from maybe 300 parts per million to 400 parts per million. Uh, you know, 300 parts per million is very small, right? And actually, if you look at Earth history, we're still kind of at like a very relatively very low level of uh, carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. You know, there were times in Earth's history in which there were 10 times, uh, 10 times higher concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, and you know, life still persisted. Uh, there was still, you know, still abundant life on Earth. It's not like it's going to, like, Earth can't cope with that, but it's going to cause changes. So as CO2 increases in the atmosphere, uh, it's also going to change the acidity of the ocean water. So uh, CO2, as you know, if we have our ocean water here, this is our ocean, and we have an increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, that CO2 is going to dissolve into the oceans and it's going to increase the um, carbonic acid. So when CO2 dissolves into water, it creates carbonic acid, HCO3, um, uh, which is carbonic acid there. So that's going to in decrease, increase the acidity, decrease the pH, okay? So that has led to things like um, what's called coral bleaching. You know, coral are actually animals. This is a picture of the close-up of the actual animals. They live in a colony together in, in the um, coral structure. When corals are alive, they're very beautiful. Um, they have a lot of vibrant colors, but after they die, the actual animal dies, um, it, it bleaches out, it turns white, and you just get these dead coral skeletons. So that coral bleaching uh, is, is an effect of an increase in ocean acidity. So acidic water makes it harder for coral reef organisms to survive, leading to coral bleaching, mass die-off of corals. Now, um, I think really what's going to play out, you know, of course, it, it takes time for evolution for, for animals to adapt and evolve. You know, I don't think that all corals are going to just die off um, as CO2 increases, but um, we're probably going to see, you know, major extinctions, and then it's going to take time for life to cope and adapt to the new conditions. Uh, so, you know, there might be corals, the kind of the latitude and the average latitude where we find coral reefs might change. Maybe we'll start to see more coral reefs at higher latitudes from now on. So, you know, I don't know. Um, it's 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 uh, it's going to just have to be something that plays out over time. Um, so anyway, that's all I really have for you today about ocean water. Um, I didn't take too long. I think it was only about 45 minutes here. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture and uh, complete your lecture assignment. And I hope you have a good weekend. And I'll talk to you next week.